Um, yesterday to this state and we can already feel some changes in the air. In this context it will be interesting to find out what new energies. Well, thank you very much and yes. thanks for the trip. Yes, yes certainly there are quite a lot is changing in Nigeria. Um, as you are aware this is a, a a large country with almost 200 million people blessed with a lot of abundant resources. But like every country, we've gone through our own challenges and difficulties. We had a civil war and we found oil and everything changed. Um, so oil essentially defined our lives and our development trajectory over the last 40 years. But with the price of oil in decline today, it means therefore that we have to restructure, we have to think, do things differently. But that itself is now beginning to help us derive new energies, new perspectives as to what is possible. Uh, Nigeria has always been great, it's, uh, Nigeria is beyond oil. And so what you see is people today who are looking out for new opportunities in the context of the recession we find ourselves. Um, ordinarily, you'll have expected people to be depressed and happy, but people see new opportunities, new challenges. And for us as a government, we see a new vista, a new horizon, where even government itself needs to now think differently and do things differently for the benefit of its people. Yeah. Um, in the context of the of time available because um, we were voted in for um, a mandate of four years. Um, do you think some of these things are achievable given um, the conditions on the ground right now and the resources you have to work with? I think the important thing is to start. You know, no country was built in a day. First thing, you have to set out a clear path, a clear direction for your people and begin to mobilize the resources. Um, Yes, there's a tendency to be in a hurry, to want to do everything now. But you know that um, it is, you, you just don't get born and become an adult or in a day. It takes, it takes time. Uh, but what we have done in the last um, nine, 10 months since we've gotten is to very quickly hit the ground running. Be very clear as to what the priorities are and what are fine. First infrastructure, our people need to get around. We had to quickly fix the roads before the rains. 
um, begin to define new opportunities, particularly in the areas of agriculture, um, begin to consensitize the people, make them conscious of the changes and the new opportunities in the environment. Um, and so across the spectrum, you know, we decided, had workshops and meetings and consensus building sessions to say, what is important for us? We are moving into a knowledge world. Education is key. Education is critical. How do we reform our education system? Where do we start? Where do we commit our resources and time to? Those are the sort of things we've done. And um, I believe that with the progress we've made in the last 10 months, after four years, we would have set a very clear trajectory where we should be going as a people. And with time, I'm sure we'll get there. Your Excellency, sir, may I know your vision for a state in, shall we say, eight to 10 years? Well, for us, we today, though, is about fifth in terms of GDP ranking in Nigeria. We expect in 10 years we'll be number two or number three. Um, we expect we'll have the best educational system in this country. We'll strengthen in our basic edu education system, so we'll produce the best self-trained um, uh, citizens in this country. We expect that we'll be an industrial hub. Because of our unique location as a state, we're right there in the middle of the country, blessed with a lot of infrastructural connections, blessed with very good land, blessed with um, the gas, onshore gas mineral resources, if we're able to put all of this together in an orderly manner with in a create an environment that is secure, that is safe, but people believe in property rights. We believe that in you know the, in the, within the first within the next ten years, clearly it don't should be number one. In terms of property rights, um, the question of deeds, how is the, state, is the state handling it? Yeah, what we've done is one, one of the first things we did was to get a company that has GIS capability, ge geographical information system capabilities, to fly over. As we speak today, we have data, aerial data or geospatial data covering 2,000 kilometers around Benin City. We expect to extend that across the state um, in the next six months. And that means flying over the state, we'll have, we have enough data, geographical uh, information, uh, to see very clearly in the minutest detail, you know, the land space. What we will then do with that data is now have a, what we call a geographical information system that will now produce deeds, will now have a proper register, so that when you buy property, when you buy <coughs> a piece of land, it's properly registered. So you really, we, I, my expectation is that in the next 24 months, Sitting down in Luxembourg, you can go and do a search and find out, you know, who owns what you're buying or who owns the property. We expect to register all properties in Edo State within the next four years. Excellency, sir, can we take you up on that? Because um, our associates in Luxembourg and the Benelux countries in general, they specifically, they, they, they were specific um, in their demand to know the situation on this. Um, we also have the intention of hosting a do business opportunity fair in several capital cities there. And if we don't have a clear um, vision of when this will be ready, we will not start with this or intention. Well, well we, we've started. Yeah. We, um, the laws are being put in place. Oh. A bill will go to the House of Assembly next week. You know, essentially legislating the, what we call the Edo Geographical Information System. We already have plans and maps. I can show you some of the plans that have been um, um, produced from the flyover of Edo State. And um, the office has been set up, people have been hired. So work has started. Let's see, sir. Um, you, you mentioned infrastructure. Talk to us about uh, Galilee Port and, you know, with timelines. What do we expect? With Gili Gili ports, as you know, that's a historical um, port. It's one of the oldest ports in this part of the world. That's how the Portuguese traders um, came into Benin Empire in historical times. 
So it still is there, it's not, it hasn't moved. So what we, uh, the plan is to work with the other agencies of government, particularly the federal government, the Nigerian Ports Authority, to dredge the Benin River and then locate a port, a river port, in an area that is very rich in gas and in agricultural produce. The difference between Gilligan Port and any other port is that it, this has been, con, con, um, it, it's been designed as a port that is meant to not just take, bring in things like containers and, um, and um, in, you know, um, materials, but the whole idea is to use the available gas around that field for industrial production, so you can bring in raw materials, process, produce, and take into other parts of the country or other parts of the sub-region. Um, we, what we've done, we've set up a, a committee, a team of you know, experts, headed by engineer Gregero, who used to be a director in NNPC, and very, a very competent professional, mostly Edo people, who've come up with a report, the first report, showing that this port will be viable, um, and it is needed. The next phase is now to fund a, feasibility, a technical feasibility study, which um, we hope should not take too long. And with that technical feasibility study, we should be able to go to the market and raise money to execute the project. So it's, it's going to be a project that is being launched or pioneered by the Edo State Government. We as a government want to enable things happen. The government, you know, we don't know how to operate ports, we don't plan to operate ports. We as a government just know that that is what is required and we'll make the resources available, available to make it happen. We, we really look forward to um, these ports coming into operation. We, we look forward to it too because yes, it's, yes. Um, if, if we get it right, it will change the face mm -hmm. of Nigeria. Yeah. With regards to the issue of security in the Gulf of Guinea, how um, the good thing is that this port is going to be on the Benin River, so it's fairly well secure. That channel is fairly well mm -hmm. secure. The challenge you have is actually, you know, on the Atlantic, yes. and um, I think that has been handled by both the Nigerian authorities and Interpol and international organisations. Um, so it should not radically affect the movement of goods in, in, on our channel. Um, I want us to talk about uh, youth. Yes. The youth. We have the problem of uh, uh, um, kidnapping, armed robbery, and uh, person trafficking. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people involved are young people. What are you doing to for the young people? And uh, say, Fulo, Edo, Edo used to produce world beaters in sports. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. It's it's a tough for the youth. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Your question has several dimensions. Yes. Okay, uh, let's look at them in the various strands. First, there is an immediate problem we have, a crisis. You have almost two generations of kids who are out there not without much to do, without very strong educational credentials. And so they are very susceptible to be misled into trafficking and a lot of other vices. That is a problem. What do we do, or what are we doing as a government? First, we're engaging them. We are, you know, trying to, you know, um, advocate, you know, create advocacy, you know, to try and ensure that we recover as many of them as we can. We've taken a very strong stance against trafficking. We have our own domestic task force on human trafficking. This is in addition to the federal uh, task force. We have, we're domesticating the laws against trafficking in Edo State. So we, we, you know, so we don't have to wait to prosecute you under federal laws. We'll also first prosecute you with our local laws to just uh, and send a message that trafficking is bad. It's beyond trafficking now. It's actually human slavery. And while you're doing that on one hand, you're encouraging and creating opportunities for them on the other hand. Today we're going to do a groundbreaking at one o'clock of the Benin Technical College. We're rebuilding that school. 
um, and we expect it to be a center of excellence in technical and vocational training, which it used to be. Um, at every point in time, we should be able to train between two and 4,000 uh, young men and women in a whole range of um, technical areas from technology to um, construction and to you know mining. Whatever opportunities we find in the marketplace, we will tra train them for, for those opportunities. So try and dissuade them from being trafficked and try and begin to provide opportunities for them. We have a lot of vocational, we are revamping our vocational training colleges across the state, looking at everybody who is training somebody for work. We're trying to understand the curriculum and the standards so that we can put a lot of them to work and give them skills so that they can find work, useful work. Um, yes, we're looking at the area of sports. We're investing in sports, you know, first ensuring that our club sides, particularly football, that is very popular. Um, we're building mini stadia in schools, you know, encouraging you know, schools in the local government area where they have land to now do, it does not have to be very sophisticated, but at least playgrounds, and then ensuring that most, you know, we're strengthening the school, uh, the, the school where we train physical um, education teachers, so that most schools now have physical education instructors and increased sport and participation at the school level, because that is where you, you, you get them. But also creating um, facilities so that young people can go and um, exercise themselves and take interest in sports. At the organizational level, we've now taken out sports from the bureaucracy to create a sports commission. So where only people who understand sports, as, not to sports as a social service, but sports as a business, as it's done everywhere else. And they're currently working a team under the uh, supervision of the deputy governor, and I'm hoping that before the end of the year, we'll have a proper commission properly set up, the sporting association strong, so that it can begin to mobilize resources to strengthen our participation in the games. So that's, those are some of the things we're doing for, the, for youths in the short term. But the, in the medium to long term, we now need to address the real problem, which is strengthening the educational system, ensuring that the curriculum, for, particularly at the basic level, is strong, so that these children are thought with technology, they can have, you know, they, they, they're knowledgeable, they can spell properly, they can speak properly, they can write properly, they can do their sums properly. And that in itself just helps imbue self-confidence in them and also opens their vista and their opportunities for life. And that the tendency so that in another five to ten years we will we're not likely to continue to have this state of hopelessness where kids leave school and you ask them what do you want to do, they say anything. <laughs> you know, because they've not, their minds have not been properly trained and structured. Um, so that is what we intend to do in the longer term. But and ultimately, ultimately, you have to organize the economy of the society to be more productive so that it can absorb people to work. That's the ultimate. And with the restructuring that is going on in Nigeria today, uh, we believe that we are on the track. The problem we had was the oil economy, which was very narrow. You know, a few people would just go and drill for oil, produce money, and we thought we were a rich country. But today, if we have to, if we have to be economically viable, we have, for, for instance, to produce a lot of the food we require. That requires a lot more people participating. We have to do a lot more money. You know, a lot more construction, and that way we'll be able to engage people and grow our economy. The last time we were here, we had a visiting some of the provinces, and the situation looked quite hopeless. We see quite a lot of those state people there as migrants, legal and illegal. And there's quite, there's quite some distinction between the few ones who are resident there legally because they can integrate, they are equipped to integrate but the vast majority are not so equipped. And um, from investigation, we can tell that they come from the provinces. So there's a lot of, there seems to be a lot of um, some kind of dislocation um, in the social system in the outside the city. I don't know what it will take to light up the state, but I know it will 
take a longer time to light up the provinces. It seems that uh, the administrative infrastructure in, place, in those places are not efficient. They, they are quite weak. The municipalities, the local councils, how do you think? Thank you. And um, we have started. I'm going to you that. You bet. We have started. Thank you very much. Um, I, as governor, am in charge. Now, I take direct responsibility and support of the local government administration. So I meet with the local government administrators every month to review what they're doing, review their policies, their strategies, and ensure that it keys into what the state is doing and what the federal Yes, like you said, there was a dislocation in the past. And that dislocation was partly um, as a result of the type of economy we were running, where as long as we produced oil, it didn't matter. Everybody just went to the center at the end of the month to collect what they could get from the federal. They didn't realize that you have to produce from the base. You know, in Europe, everything happens at the local municipal level. The good thing is that with the restructuring the economy which we are witnessing today, a lot will now, is now beginning to happen at the local level, particularly in the area of agriculture and mining, um, because that is where the activities exist. So our role as government is first to ensure security, stability, provide social services. One of the things, projects we are working on in Edo State today, and you find it very interesting, before 1973, there were very few expressways in Nigeria. Most roads that were constructed in colonial times passed through communities. But with all of them, we now began to build expressways to bypass communities, which bypassed many communities. So if you wanted progress in the community, you have to move your own village to the road. And so that was where the dislocation started. So what we are doing now is helping re-establish those infrastructure that connected communities so that if you went to one farm, you could, you know, your farm wasn't far from a particular uh, community where you could go and reside or have a home. We also, you know, um, ensure that we provide social services, primary health care center, strengthening the primary school system in, those, in the localities and in the, in the local governments. And we have an advantage today. Today you can have cheap distributed power. You don't have to wait for electricity from the grid. With alternative sources of energy like solar, like wind, you can, you know, you can, you know, have electricity. You can power your your, your, your dispensaries or primary healthcare centers. You can power your primary schools. You can you can have a, a decent social life. In the rural area, those are the things we're working on, and we are harnessing opportunities to ensure that. Your Excellency, sir, um, the state has a, quite a sizable population in the diaspora. A potent force, if you ask me. I don't know if you are going to, or if you have established an office uh, of a doing diaspora, or if you are considering such, and uh, if there are incentives for them to come back home here and invest. Okay, we have a ministry, for the first time, we now have a ministry for diaspora. So, administratively, we have recognized that it's a potent force, and we are organized internally to be able to respond to the, the, the diaspora population we have. Um, I used to be in the diaspora, so I have a sense of what the issues will be. Because when you live outside, you live in fairly organized societies, and there's certain, so you expect to, there's certain expectations you have. What is it that those in the diaspora want to do at home? They want to invest, and they want to hopefully come back here at some point in time. So, for them to be able to come back and be integrated, this place needs to be organized and look somewhat like where they are now. And therefore, those are the things we've been talking about and trying to do. First, we have to plan our cities so that they are orderly. 
you can have maps, you can, you have to make them secure. If you, there's an incident, you can pick up a phone and call a little policeman, a policeman down the road, you know. Those are things we are used to. If there is an emergency, you can call an ambulance service to take you. You know, the hospitals work, you know, you have community hospitals that you can get to if you have, you know, not too serious ailments, and you have good referral centers or tertiary hospitals that can treat you. So those things at the base need to be in place because those are what you're used to. Um, in terms of investment, to build those things, you need capital, and that's where we feel that they will come, they can come in. Um, but you've got to organize things in the way they understand it. Take housing, if you plan in an area, you plan in a city, you've designed, you want to cut. If people are not used to, how many people abroad go and buy, build homes? They just buy. So you have to have a system that encourages people to invest in properties, design, develop properties with very clear titles, with clear services where they can so it's easier for you to say look i want to buy um, yeah, a property in a, in, a, in a the area is zoned you can go online you can check titles you can check and then decide and determine how to not get to pay and send money directly into an account rather than in the past you want property you have to go and look for land begin to look for somebody to build and they'll send you pictures of what doesn't exist and you know so we are restructuring all of those so that it's easy for you to invest in real estate. We're also looking at economic opportunities. Take agriculture, for instance. I don't expect you, as it is an agricultural opportunity, I don't expect you to come here and, and essentially own the tractors and do all that yourself. For instance, we have a scheme where we can, we, we have a big off ticker. So you have a big company that's into oil, right? And we say to them, Give 25% of your, your farm you require. Sure, let us break them into investment parcels, 10 hectares each. We'll have people who will come and invest in them. They'll hire people, they'll produce. And so rather than you buying a house, for instance, you can decide to buy a lot, a 10 hectare palm or oil palm lot. Right? After three years, it gives you a certain return for 20 years. <laughs> it's a win win for everybody. So that's participating in agriculture. And, you know, that's, so there's so many several schemes, but you've got to organize you know, society in a certain way, have the basics, and begin to build on them. One of the critical and minimum, I mean, what I would call the irreducible minimum, is law and order. That's why we've been very strict on law and order. People just cannot be unruly and decide to be here the way they like. You know, so if you heard, we have been admonishing um, the young men who you know, uh, who used to tout, you know, leave the streets. We're trying to find work for them. We're trying to reorientate them, give them a new lease of life, so that people, so that we are attractive for investment, so that people who want to invest find the do as a home. They feel very comfortable. They enjoy the hospitality, and they want to. Yes. So on the issue of tourism, tourism development. Uh, I don't know what the, I think what your administration is doing about it. I know the time for government involvement in the building passed. Mm -hmm. um, but perhaps in your policy, the design to attract uh, investors in tourism to build chains of hotel facilities or so that um, people can come and expect some kind of standard? Yes, um, it is evolving. We are fortunate that we are a natural tourist catchment zone. Because just by our location, the state, you cannot go from the east to the west of this country or to the south without going through a new state. So, particularly domestic tourists, I mean, this is a whole, you people have to post, go through here. So the issue is, how do you create events, how do you create facilities for people to stop and enjoy what exists? There are, we, we, the building city and Edo State is, is replete with a lot of hotels and um, hospitality places. What we need to do and what our plan is, is to just upgrade, you know, help 
improve the standards, improve the management. But more importantly, for government to improve the infrastructure. You know, um, rarely will people just say, oh, I want to, yes, there are people who come in and say, we just want to come and, we read about the modes, this ancient modes, we want to come and see what it looks like. We watched the coronation of the Oba, which was, you know, a lot of splendor. We want to come and see. So we are building this infrastructure around the, particularly the historical areas. So when people come in, you can walk around. I mean, it's going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to document these monuments. We are refurbishing our museum. There's an exhibit from the Smithsonian that's going to come up next week. As it, you know, and so we're beginning to also create that consciousness that there's a lot of arts, there's a lot of culture, there's eco-tourism, there's business tourism, uh, then medical tourism, and maybe academic tourism that exists here, and that um, the environment for these to try, for you to come and see, exists. So that is part of the, that is the plan. The plan is government, build infrastructure, if people come, they have roads for the for the investors who will want to build hotels, you have set, set the standards for them, give them the information so that they can they can um, understand the feasibility of yes. what they're getting into. And then also make sure that when people come, they feel safe and they are, the places they want to visit are all properly organized yes. and documented. Yes. And so, um, if it would just take to go a step further, of representing in terms of dissemination of information on tourism events, what exists, etc., for people who've uh, perhaps never come here, that leaving it for the um, the embassy so that might not have the capacity to do not. I mean, using ICT solutions. I think this is for us. One, the goal is made is to go and be talking and making the noise before we actually do what we're supposed to do. As a government, we want to organize ourselves, we want to make sure that we create things first, so that when we are talking about something on an issue or a matter, we are just not making empty promises or noises. You come in and you see yourself. In the next 24 months, we'll have solid plans tested, and we can show you we've done this, right? And let us grow from that. So, as a government, we do not feel the right thing is to, yes, there's a need, there's a demand, but let's step back, let's plan, let's think, let's understand what we want to do properly, and let's resource ourselves to do it properly before we go and make the noises about it. Nice. Your Excellency, I must thank you for the time you've given to us, to receive us in your office, um, and um, to talk about these things. We will, we promise to take it back to our people out there and we hope to come again um, finally when everything is ready so that we'll come out with our megaphones and vuvuzelas down there and say okay action. We thank you very much. We want to assure you that we're doing a lot of work and um, we will come out and market ourselves also with you once we are convinced that we have packaged things that can be accepted internationally. I want to thank you once again. This is me. This map, this is our quadrant booth, where we have flown on the right, so we have the entire city. That's the peak. We have a map like this, where from the you see, this is I'm just wanting to show you that this is a 10 centimeter aerial photography done in February 2017. Uh, well, this is the entire 2000 square, uh, 2000 square. Uh, what you see is that you see each of this is like a little book. You can now go further in and look at a particular thing. For instance, this is. This is 293, right? So 293, 293, right? That's like the city center. And you can shoot. Okay, that's the city center, for instance. Green Road. So what this says is that with this kind of data, you now 
put them into you know, systems that are also for technology side. We can't anyway now do your service and register each property in the city and give you titles. Such that you can see a map like this, right? A bit of a map, right? This is two and three, a section of that. This is the ring road. Right? You can actually see every property. You can see the pickings. This is the museum. Right? Yes. This is uh, part of this is this is part of um, of um, of our markets. Yes. Right? You can see very clear details of so it's easy to register and document them. So you can actually go online yourself. Okay. And, and um, if you want to buy a piece of property, you do it for you, you just go and check. Yes. You can actually produce like we've done here. You can see this is the Jerry here. You can see you see the fences? Yes. Sir. This is all from data obtained here. Oh, oh. So I don't have to wait to oh. you know all of this is already going to be registered and digitized. So if you want to buy land, you can just go into the registry. Check when it's and it pops up and if you tell you who owns it, when it was last transferred, mm -hmm. just like it's impressive. It's impressive. It's impressive. Yeah, 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 yeah.